thank you for inviting me to be here today. There's a great lineup over the course of the day and I'm really looking forward to seeing the discussions as they emerge um, from those presentations. So thank you to Danilo, to Louis, to Culture Labs. Um, that was a great overview of your brilliant pro um, uh, product, if you like. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, I look forward to playing around with it myself. Okay, so I'm gonna share some slides. I haven't got many, which is around museums, social media and participation at this particular moment during the pandemic. Um, and as you'll all be very well aware, we obviously entered a period of national lockdowns in early 2020 and cultural institutions around the globe had to, at that point, really step up their efforts to translate interactions with members of the public into the digital environment, including obviously then the varied spaces of social media. And they entered a period of crisis from which really they have yet to emerge. So in those early weeks of lockdown, there was a sharp increase, as you'll be aware, in virtual productions and remote opportunities. And many existing what we might call content assets were repackaged for social media in anticipation of a wholesale shift to digital cultural engagement by audiences. So during this pivot to digital, as it has been called, and I think we are allowed to shudder when we hear that term, but it's one that we've been using, uh, as Sharon Janot notes, the largest digital platforms for the dissemination of cultural content boomed, with Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, in particular experiencing what she calls a financial bonanza. But less is understood, however, about how cultural organisations operating perhaps at a regional or national level experienced that pivot. So, as Louis has said, as a part of a project which is being funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, which is exploring the impacts of COVID-19 on the UK creative and cultural sector, uh, being led by the Centre for Cultural Value, myself and a colleague of mine, Eva Nieto McAvoy, um, have been looking at social media interactions in particular during that time. And we're looking at them across two hashtags. You can see them here on the screen. We're looking at museum at home and culture in quarantine. So we've got something like 10,000 tweets from the first six weeks of the UK lockdown that we're looking at. So that is our framing. And I acknowledge that that is a limited framing. It's limited in terms of platform, dates, geography, language, although we do have a somewhat international sample. And what we're doing with those 10,000 tweets is analyzing them with a view to investigating the questions that you can see on the screen here. So firstly, we're interested in what kinds of content were being circulated and who was circulating that content. We're interested in what kinds of content that was shared uh, gained the most traction and how we can begin to understand why that was uh, through a thematic analysis of that content um, or perhaps understanding the tone of that content. So was it, for example, content that expressly linked to the pandemic, to well-being, perhaps, or to education that really galvanised people? Or was it content that was expressly emotional or hopeful or humorous that really got people uh, interested? Thirdly, we wanted to explore what kinds of participation and engagement ensued around that content and to think about whether our sample demonstrates maybe a shift from previous findings about the nature of engagement with and by museums in social media. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And then lastly, we want to think about how and whether the tweets that we're looking at intersect with broader debates at that time about, for example, the pandemic response, its associated inequalities, or the fate of arts and culture in that context? And if so, what are the implications of that then? So when we talk about engagement, we're understanding that across a number of trajectories in the study that we're doing. So we're looking at that through a snapshot of the stats, likes, quote, tweets, retweets, um, but an acknowledgement that that's quite a limited way of understanding engagement. We're also doing a nuanced and systematic unpacking of a subset of all of the tweets. So we've taken a random sample of a thousand of those 10,000 tweets and we're using that smaller sample 
as a kind of way of, you know, thickening, if you like, the data for the analysis. It's a kind of thickening strategy to use that um, term by Clifford Geertz. And that recognizes then that having lots and lots of data is not in and of itself an indicator of, you know, good quality research or insightful data. So we're, you know, trying to look at uh, this data set, you know, for its breadth and its depth. So there is already, as I've said, a body of scholarship that we can use to help articulate, understand and critique the patterns of participation that were facilitated across these hashtags. And that comes particularly from the museum studies and digital cultural heritage fields. That research has tended in the past to conclude that dynamic two-way interaction or dialogue is difficult to engender in these contexts and that it's seemingly not been a priority for many institutions for whom social media has predominantly served a marketing and promotions function. There's nothing wrong with that, that just kind of speaks to what the majority of institutions um, tend to find themselves doing in that space. But literature which is already emerging from this period of lockdown has begun to investigate the possibility that social media participation has been energized in some way and made vital in new ways during this moment. So Areti Galani and I wrote a piece in Museum and Society about that, uh, and I'll pop a link in the, in the chat to that. And our current study then for the Center for Cultural Value seeks to explore that possibility further through this detailed analysis of that participation. So in my abstract for Danilo and Louis, I propose that I would be presenting an analysis of that data, but full disclosure, I should note that the thematic analysis we're doing is still underway. So what I'm going to do, and given that time is brief, is to present a couple of examples which crop up in the, in the data. They're maybe not the most kind of, you know, surprising of examples, but I think they act as a kind of a gateway for exploring some of the broader implications of the study and of this moment then. So the first example, and this is the really kind of unsurprising one, is the kind of Getty Museum challenge piece. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it. Uh, given the popularity of this, the extraordinary social media response, the many column inches and blog posts that have been dedicated to it over the last 12 months or so, it was bound to crop up in our study and it does lots. Uh, as I say, you're probably familiar with it. And just to show you a really hideously boring slide for which I apologize in advance, you can begin to see how it crops up in our study. So um, the kind of first uh, peak, if you like, on this graph at the end of March, there is the Getty Museum challenge kind of um, taking off. And so it kind of, you know, it, it shapes um, and, you know, skews perhaps in some way the data that we have. So we have to acknowledge it. And uh, here it is. So we get this, you know, this Getty Museum um, tweet challenging us to recreate a work of art with objects, choosing a favorite artwork, finding three things lying around the house and recreating the artwork. And of course, many, many people did. There's a very clear call to action here and people responded. So in many countries, the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, of course, happened very swiftly. It happened very comprehensively and physical access to cultural institutions was suddenly impossible. Many museum staff began working from home and within a matter of hours, cultural institutions were beginning to circulate existing cultural uh, digital assets online. And social media managers, of course, became in many cases the primary interface with users and audiences. And they, you know, in many cases continue to be. So on the 25th of March, we get this tweet. And of course, there was huge interest in it. And as I say, a great many responses. And what's really notable and marked about those responses, I think, is the vibrancy and creativity of them. And that was something that people were really intrigued by. And of course, picked up on in, you know, as I say, the many press reports and things that, um, that emerged around it. So people of all ages from around the globe embraced this challenge, sharing photos, featuring their interpretations then of artworks from the Getty collection but of course from other institutions as well. Remarkably, people are still sharing their responses nearly a year later. So these kinds of initiatives go part way to explaining the shape of our overarching data set. Um, another boring slide here, apologies. And you can see that nearly half of the tweets that we are looking at feature photos and images. We're still unpacking that, but, but Getty is a part of that, of course. 
So there seemed to be something particular to the lockdown context that made this challenge really appealing for people. People were, of course, kind of imprisoned in their homes. They had limited resources. And this gave the contributions a quirky and very much kind of homemade aesthetic. The reuse of household items in the photos ranged from the surreal to the preposterous. And many people centered props that spoke to the particular conditions of lockdown. So stockpiled foodstuffs, toilet rolls, face masks, thermometers, they're all in there. Photos, of course, featuring user, audience or visitor recreations of artworks are, of course, not new. But what was really striking, I think, about the Getty Museum challenge was how comprehensively that content crept into the social media feeds of a broader public who were eager to share and eager then to engage with that content. And in the context of lockdown, these contributions were seen by many as being performances of strength and of creativity, you know, the responses to them attest to this. And many of the contributions are powerfully embodied like this one here. Through these kinds of initiatives, we see vividly then the potential for a more dynamic and playful communications interplay when where museums shift from an understanding of social networks, principally in terms of promotional marketing, and try instead to embrace the affordances and logics of social networks, their pace, their intimacy, their strangeness, their connectivity. So let's look at another example, and I've chosen another playful example, which I think uh, sheds light again on uh, another kind of high level finding from the research. And this comes with a content warning because it features spiders, but they are cute ones. So I'm hoping you'll forgive me for that. So here we have then the Queensland Museum spider suit. Again, you may be familiar with this one. So although, as I noted, there were lots of images and photos in our sample, it's notable how many of the most liked, quoted and engaged with tweets include video. That's perhaps unsurprising, given what we know about the importance of video content in social media more broadly, but it's really notable in our sample. So this is a real gem. And with any luck, uh, tech allowing, I'm going to uh, encourage us just to take a quick look at it. And I'm going to pull my headphones out so hopefully you can hear it because there's a little bit of. And I think you'll agree it's a gem. Can you hear that? Just make sure that when I call you, you come back. Don't upset anybody. Sorry. Hello, there you And off he goes. Fantastic. And it kind of, you know, just uh, goes around on a loop like that. Okay, so we've got our heads around that. Okay, so a kind of, you know, neat little bit of, bit of content there. And again, it really, uh, it really got people going. So in response to that tweet, uh, we get another really playful set of responses and responses then to responses. There are those who just want to tell us that they love the puppet, they believe it's cute, they wanna keep it as a pet. Uh, the post get lo gets loads of kudos, it's uh, legit amazing, it's the best COVID-19 video to date, the best content on the internet today, no exceptions. And for one user, it's the kind of uh, wholesome content that they live for on the web, yeah. So another makes a solid connection to COVID times by suggesting the suit might be helpful for social distancing, which is kind of nice. There are highly expressive responses, uh, such as the others on the screen here. There are loads of emoji and a number of GIFs and photos in response. So here is my favorite GIF. We've got YouTube sensation here, Lucas the Spider, who appears a number of times in the sample. And I think the use of GIFs in the sample is really interesting as it is more broadly when it comes to kind of uh, digital heritage work in this space, as it puts this bit of content into conversation with, a, uh, with content or ideas from elsewhere in the digital culture ecosystem. And of course, this is what the Absolute Unit did so well a couple of years ago. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, with that and uh, the, you know, the popularity of that, that particular piece of social media content and how it's been talked about in the sector since. So in our sample then around our, our spider content, 
This then draws out into a smaller subset of responses from people who really miss physical interactions with this museum. Gosh, I miss the museum, says one. One of the worst things about lockdown was missing last weekend's uh, show, says another. So there are a few of these and this last response, which I think is pretty much the living the dream response for a social media manager. Oh my gosh, I love this. I wish I worked with a museum so I could be part of jokes like this, um, says one person. So these kinds of engagements, there are 219 responses, but then the responses to responses over the two weeks that followed, many of which were themselves re retweeted, quote tweeted and liked. Uh, amount to thousands more interactions than with the initial bit of content and they demonstrate again the value of playful interaction in the social media environment again there's vibrancy there's creativity there's humor there is back and forth and a real sense of the museum as a still living breathing place even if it might for now be closed or you know even overrun by the specimens so these behind the scenes snapshots proved to be popular in our sample, demonstrating a kind of longing, if you like, for the reassurance and the familiarity of the physical space and place of a museum. And that seems to be suggested, you know, even remotely through this kind of content. In the previous example and in this one, we get a sense of the many ways digital engagements are being shaped by their real world contexts. COVID, the restrictions, the loneliness, the fear, the boredom is of course an underlying and sedimented theme right across our sample. So some thoughts about all of that then. I think as we tentatively and I hope sensitively turn to talking about a post COVID recovery for the sector, what can we learn from analyses such as ours? And of course ours, ours will not be the only one by any means. Well, this kind of research begins to reveal what seemed to work and what worked less well, perhaps, as strategies for engagement during this pandemic. It tells a story about the kinds of content and interaction that users found valuable. And it helps us to begin to think about how we can talk about the value of this work during a time of crisis. As Irene noted, it gives us a chance for reflection and it gives us a base to build uh, build from, which extends across institutions and perhaps across, you know, regions and uh, different kinds of institutions as well. So in the next stages of our analysis, we're looking at the themes present in the research, as I said, and that's analysis, an analysis I hope will reveal the extent of the social impact of museums digital content during this time, at least in our sample. How far did this content become a catalyst for creativity? To what extent did it help us to connect and to express our emotions? And did it advocate for the power and role of the arts and culture to change lives or perhaps to make them more bearable at this kind of a time? It will give us a sense of the values recognized or debated within the orbit of that content, community, inclusion, health, respect and creativity, for example, and how that content connected with other hashtags, debates and campaigns. So the pivot to digital was not only about shifting the locus of cultural activity, but can be understood as part of cultural organizations, real world contribution to the pandemic response. At least this is an argument that some people are starting to make. Might they have contributed to a reduction in isolation and loneliness giving people a sense of community while they stayed at home? Might they have provided valuable diversion, solace and inspiration? Might this constitute evidence that those working in the creative sector were providing an essential service, as some have proposed? It will take time, of course, to meaningfully and to robustly respond to those kinds of questions, but my hope is that we will. We'll be able to see how, across our limited data set, admittedly, cultural institutions found themselves dynamically and consequentially co-located in time and space within what Zap Zapovinia calls the global searchable talk of social media networks. We already hear that the pandemic has demonstrated a need in the short to medium term at least for investment in digital infrastructure and competency in the sector. And I suspect on the basis of our analysis, we'll be able to support that kind of a claim as it pertains to further investment in social media activity. 
that it too has a demonstrable part to play in meeting museums' ambitions for social impact and for participation. But we must be clear about some of the challenges here as well. It's so seductive to assume that social media is a democratized medium. And we must of course remember that social networks do not constitute a diverse and open conversation that anybody can be a part of. Far from it, in these platforms, somebody is always being excluded. Evidence shows that digital exclusion is still a big problem, a matter of education, age, ethnicity, gender, ability, geography. And it's a sobering observation that generally it's those same people who are disenfranchised offline who are disenfranchised online. We have seen that in the last 12 months. Digital inequality is really complicated. It's not just about whether somebody is connected or not. And we need to do a better job, I think, in the sector of understanding the relationship between inequalities as well. D digital inequality and how it plays into health inequality, for example, or financial inequity, educational inequality, inequalities in power and in participation. Ellen Helsper's new book on digital inequality, which is released today, I think is going to be really helpful in beginning to think about some of that. We know also that not all social media contributions are perceived to be of equal value. So influencer posts or responses, for example, are hotly anticipated. And the simple truth is that museums probably place a greater value on those than they do of the average user. Of course, that's something we can discuss. How we understand the shape and significance of social media participation for museums then is challenging and will change over time and in different contexts. There are real opportunities though, I think here yeah, for engagement, for dialogue and for challenge. And I think that was never more apparent really than during the 2020 lockdown, when the work of museum social media managers who already dedicate their professional lives to navigating these spaces with sensitivity and with passion became so intensely visible and so important as a point of connection. Yes, social media participation is complex, but it is significant, I think, for the noisy, playful, sometimes incoherent digital public that it gives us access to. And at that point, I will stop. And there are a couple of resources on this last slide, just in case anyone wants to pick up on any of those um, articles and things that I've quoted. Thank you.